South African investors have lost billions to a very posh financial broker. Not only investors, but financial advisors were fooled. But Magnus Haystek was not fooled. Welcome, Magnus. Yeah, good morning, Chris. Nice talking to you again. I mean, this is just, again, one of those incredible stories that every now and then it just bursts on the financial scene and you you just shake your head that after so many years and after so many scams and after so much coverage by the media, you, you still find a scam. And this is a Ponzi scheme. And, I mean, business has been running with the story fantastically well, way ahead of the other media. And there's a substantial amount of money involved. And you just you just shake your head and say, how is this possible? In this day and age, all the checks and counter checks and, and and internet that enables you to do your own homework if you want to, that people can still create an investment scam with an only three billion rand that's not missing. We don't know the final number yet. But, you know, there's no doubt about it. The uh, perpetrator of this scam, Craig Warren, has admitted and said, oh, it's a scam. I uh, robbed Peter to pay Paul, lock me up. And uh, so away the keys. Now, that's quite commendable, but I think that as the authorities and the media dig, dig, dig further into this, more is going to be uh, uncovered as, as time goes by. And, and we expect some, some more um, declarations coming out quite soon. So it just, it just amazes me that these things still happen. But you realized a long time ago that something was seriously amiss. What happened? Well, you know, someone once described you as someone who's got a very well-developed bullshit barometer or antenna. I, I kind of pick up these things because I was a journalist for 20 years, as you well know, and spent a lot, a lot of time and investigations into the master bonds and the supreme bonds and the leader guards and the pick vests and the sham axes. So I've, I've kind of made it a hobby of mine to investigate these things and to see what kind of characteristics you look for when you are approached with a fantastic, too good to be true investment scheme. So, so personally, I've written hundreds of articles on these types of scams. So when this scam came across my desk, I didn't know it was a scam at the time. I just looked at the investment. You know, we were pressed a couple of years ago to, I can't even remember who knocked on our door and said, don't you want to sell this to your clients? And I think it took me about five minutes to look at it and throw this away and said, this is rubbish. But lo and behold, I came across a client who already had an existing investment with, with um, a brokerage called Global and Local. And, and, and one of the investments was this BHI investment. We started asking questions and said, what is this? And we started stretching and then we, then we were told, no, nah, it's this, this genius trader was develop a system to arbitrage between three or four local and global shares, and he would make a profit every day. And, you know, the usual bullshit story, excuse my French, but it was rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. But we, we took it a bit further, and, and we were trying to get this money out of out of BHI, and we were not very successful. And eventually, we, we tended that we wanted to put more money into the scheme, and then suddenly they were all over us, and fill in these forms and that application. And eventually, to cut a long story short, we just convinced the client to finally demand the repayment of, of their money. It was almost 3 million rand. And luckily, I mean, that, that is one loss that was prevented. But the, the incredible thing was you had this big administration scheme called Rubicon Administrators operating from, you know, 208 to Marange, uh, uh, in Marantia, um it was the, the, the same address as Global and Local. So I suspect at this point in time that Global and Local was also the administrator of the scheme because you need an, an administrator to run a scheme like this. Someone who's running the scheme cannot do all the admins. So there was a big machine behind it, which was, and of course, Alec has been trying to get hold of Global and Local for weeks now and nothing has happened. But they've now been implicated very clearly in official documents. They've been selling it to their clients, very big upfront commissions. And uh, so we still need to talk to global and local. But yeah, again, you have very smart people handing over large amounts of money into a scheme which, by their own admission on their documents, says this is a trust. It's an unregulated scheme. It's not regulated by anybody in South Africa. 
your money is high risk. You can lose it all. And the fund manager will take about 10% of your, your money every year for their fees. Please sign here and send your money. And people did it. Uh, and that, that, that is the scary part, that smart, sophisticated people, and it's in big print, it's not even a small print, where it basically says, this is a scam, invest here, and people will still put their money in. And I mean, it could be a, a, a fantastic uh, story if you, you go make, a, make a joke out of it, and it says, this is a scam, but put your money in, and people did. <laughs> And 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 that that's what gets me about this story. I mean, they were they were they, they weren't trying to hide it. So you know, that's it's quite an astonishing story. And I think more will come out in time. And so this is very regrettable for the industry. It creates again this impression that you know all financial advisors are crooks and scamsters and will grab your money. And with the with the result, people got put their money in the bank and in the store that they don't want to invest money because they have to invest. So this is a, a very unique story once again. So if people didn't read the fine print or read it and signed anyway, what recourse do they have now? Well, that's where now the, all the lawyers will jump onto this and everybody will, you know, people are now obviously, and I tried to sound this Rubicon administrators this morning and a and, uh, voice message came on and said, due to high load of calls, we cannot take your call. Um, please direct your queries to k attorneys, the attorneys that you interviewed on business the other day. So they now blocking and said we're not interested. So we deal with it to this. But I think on individual cases, people are going to sue their advisors directly, um, or if they can, if there's money. So you know, this is just this creates a terrible ripple effect that so many people get sucked in. So much time is wasted. You've got liquidators stepping in and 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 the regulators and. It's, it's, and of course, you're sitting with a lot of people, as we understand, have lost their money. Again, I cannot understand when I read reports it's about people who've lost all their money in one scam. You know, you're breaking all the investment rules of the uh, uh, of the business. I mean, it, it's, it stands to reason that even in the best managed and regulated funds in the world, you do not put all your money in one fund or all your eggs in one basket. So people still break those rules today. That is what I don't understand. And, you know, when someone says, I've lost all my money in a scam, and I've seen this before with the share max, big best, leader guards, how could you put all your money into one investment? And again, we just see a repeat of that. And that, that, that just astounds me. So I think a lot more is going to come out. I think global and local are, are running to the hills. Yeah, at this point in time that they were the administrators of this of this of this scheme. We don't know what the final amount was and for how long it's been perpetrated, but there we are. At least we have one investor who got their money out early because it just didn't make sense. You don't give your money to one smart guy who claims he can beat the system, he can beat the market. That's why I've got regulated funds. And you know, one thing I need to say, Chris. You know, we can complain about many things in this country, but we do have a very well-regulated financial services industry. I mean, I know that compliance is, is a big bugbear for a lot of people, including my own company and everybody else, but it does protect the, the, the final client in many, many respects. And, and, and that is something that we need to protect uh, because we do have a very good financial services industry with good, solid regulation. And just follow the rules. You know, it's, it's like anything in life. Don't try and break the rules to achieve a certain outcome. Just follow the rules. Pay your fees to qualified fund managers, to platforms, advisors, and the outcome will be good and fairly predictable. But it, there's something in human beings that just wants them to break the rules. They want to be special. They want to be different. They want to be you know, uh, part of a secret clan who knows how to make more money than the rest. And again, we, again we've seen it doesn't work. Now, in the history of Ponzi schemes in South Africa, where does this one fit in? You know, going back in time, you know, Eric and I were to journalists many years ago. We wrote about the master bonds, uh, supreme bonds, um, the Magnum Group. Uh, we wrote about leader gods, Shamex. Shamex is probably 
the biggest one. We 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 peak vest for five billion. So this is up there with probably I would I would say they're in the top five. Well, this one is currently, as far as we know, you know, in the top five of Ponzi schemes in terms of quantum, in terms of numbers. But all will come out. It'll be, you know, if this does go to judicial inquiries, which will run for a very long time, it'll come out as a fairly big one because we're talking big numbers, large investors. Now, I wonder, do you think he set out to do this or financial misfortune uh, propelled him into this Ponzi scheme? What What's your take? You know, it, it's hard to say. I mean, you start with a scheme that, that's different, that breaks the rules, small scale, and it works for a while, and, it, and, and suddenly it runs away from you. It works better than you expected. You start getting used to this flow of money. You start dipping into the accounts of your clients. Nobody picks it up. Auditors don't pick it up. The advisors don't pick it up. Next year, you dip in a bit more. You buy yourself a small Ferrari. You carry on for a year or two, the scheme is growing, and you think you can get away with it. You think you're a master of the universe. You think, well, I'm smarter than the system. They're not going to catch me. And eventually, at some point in time, it does. It would appear that this took, you know, 15 to 20 years. And uh, in the process, I mean, Craig Warren, and by his own admission, says, you know, I, I robbed Peter to pay Paul. He seems to have given away a lot of the money to the Sanstidians old school or the alumni club and the sports center and driving, you know, Ferraris and that kind of stuff. Not that I have anything against Ferraris, but um, you get you get into it. It's difficult to get out because now you now you're short. You need if you have to liquidate the whole fund, you know that there's going to be a hole in your books. And the same with Madoff. You keep on going. You keep on plugging away, thinking that miraculously this will recover, and then it does. And then one day. Just finally, you have one or two large investors who say, look, I want my money back for whatever reason. And you realize the game is over. And that's what happened. It seems to have happened with with, with Warren. uh, There must be a price on his head or more than one price. Do you think he handed himself over uh, for the sake of his own safety? Uh, It it would appear so that he chose this very well. He went to a very small uh, magistrate. uh, Court somewhere in Cutlow, where nobody would realize it, the media won't even pick it up because normally any journalist can look at the media roles to what's on court today. I think you were a legal, legal reporter at one stage as well. And then you can see these things coming. So he went and then he requested a single cell. So maybe he's worried, you know, that they can come after him. He thought it was safer inside than on the outside. <laughs> Do, uh, but, but but he's now realised it's not so safe on the inside either, uh, because yeah. apparently he's yeah. received death threats uh, from yeah. inmates. So you know it's very really, very really sad, and, uh, and and a lot of people are going to lose their money. And be a, you know you, you have to turn around and say, look at the mirror. You put this money in. You didn't read the forms. It seems me clearly this is a very dangerous investment scheme. Mm. You know it's very hard to have a lot of sympathy for somebody who said, well I didn't read the fine print. This wasn't even a fine print. This large print it says dangerous, risky, unregulated, but put your money in anyway. And people do it. So that's very, very sad. Thank you. That was Martin Seistek of Brentworth, Brenthurst Wealth Management speaking to Biz News about the Ponzi scheme that has seen investors lose billions. 